So like I said, today we're talking about good grace. We are still in the book of Ephesians. And um, we can get this. There we go. Good grace. Ephesians, we're in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, which is going to be page 799 in your pewback Bibles. Okay? And, you know, grace is something that I actually struggle with because, I don't know, you can call it insecurity, I'm not really sure what it is, but a lot of times I feel like I'm undeserving of this grace that God gives us because he gives it so freely. And here in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's going to take us through a little journey of who we were, who we are, and what we are supposed to do now because of this grace. So in Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles ready, we are going to be, we get this thing to work here, There we go. Come on, next one. There we go. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Whoops. Sorry, sometimes it kicks a little too far. All of us who... All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is who we were, okay? We were, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Now, what is transgressions and sin? Transgression is more like the breaking of a trust, okay? Sin is basically going against anything that has to do with, with God. And God, and here Paul says that we were dead in our transgressions and sin because we broke trust with God. We weren't living as we were supposed to live with him. We were trying to gratify our own selfish desires, our own needs, and basically trying to live our lives the way we want to live. Okay? At one time, all of us, all of us were living like this according to our own selfish desires desires, but God. And that's where we see in the next one, we'll just keep going with up there. Uh, In the next verses, in verse five, but because of his great love for us, actually this is verse four, that's a typo, sorry about that. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. This is who we are now. Okay? And what's interesting about this, if you look at this verse again, in Ephesians chapter 4, or chapter 2, verse 4, if we look at this verse again, it says, because of his great love. Okay? Now, what's interesting here is the word great. Okay? Because what does great love mean? I was thinking about this, and I thought, oh, and I kind of went back to my childhood, the old Tony the Tiger commercial for Frosty Flakes. They're great. Not really what he was trying to say here. The great that he uses, the Greek word that he uses for great, basically means remarkable or a magnitude, a huge magnitude of grace, a never-ending amount of flowing grace for us because it is his great love for us and, his rich, and who is rich in mercy, he made us alive even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. That's the good grace. That even though yet we were dead in our transgressions, even though we were dead in our sins, and this is who we are now, we are now children of God. Okay? He has made us alive with Christ. Okay? So that is who we are now. Now we go to verses 7 and 8. And we see, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You see, it all starts with grace, an incomparable grace. And this word incomparable means a surpassing grace, a grace that goes beyond our knowledge. You see, if we wrong somebody or if we do something wrong, 
The world would say punishment. The world would say you deserve the worst. But God says no. God says if you have a relationship with my son, you are saved from that punishment. See, that's mercy. See, there's a difference between mercy and grace, and we kind of kind of have to understand that because mercy is being spared from a punishment. Again, like I said, the world would say, if you did something wrong, you need to be punished. We see that all the time. You break the law, you're speeding down the road, you get a ticket, that was your punishment. Every once in a while, though, you get the sweet talk, that officer, and he goes, I'm going to let you go with the warning this time. Don't do it again. That's mercy. Okay? Grace would be if that same officer who spared you from that ticket reached in his pocket, and I've, I've seen on the news some police officers do this, reach into his pocket, whips out a little $25 Target gift card and says, here, even though you sped and you, you did slow down and I did stop you and you interacted with me kindly, here's a $25 Target gift card. That's grace, getting something you don't deserve. And see, that's what Paul is explaining to us here in Ephesians chapter 2, that because God is rich in mercy, and ever abundant supply of grace, we have access to this. He gives this to us freely. It's a free gift of God that no one, no one can boast about, not even ourselves. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. It is all given through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is initiated through faith in the work of Jesus Christ. Again, look at what he said. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So when God looks at us in the beginning, before we become a Christian, before we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are dead in our transgressions. We are dead in our sins. He goes, but I can still save you. But you have to have a relationship with my son. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? See, grace changes everything because there's nothing you can do to clean yourself up. I've heard people say this a hundred times, and this was kind of my problem with grace too. And that is, oh, I can, you know, if I can just do better, maybe I'll go to church and, and, and try out this Jesus thing. We can't do better. If the Bible is 100% accurate, if it's the infallible word of God, and it says we are born in sin, that we are sinful human being, that Jesus himself even said, I know what's in the heart of man, then there's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right for God. Because God doesn't want you made right. If you can make yourself right, what would you need him for? This is what grace and mercy is. Because, because according to our sins, the Bible says the wages of sin are death. In other words, when you sin, when we sin, when we live a sinful life outside of Christ, our payment for that is death. But then that same verse says, but the free gift of God through Jesus Christ is eternal life. When we have a relationship, when we choose him, God says you are no longer under my wrath. You are now under and covered by grace. Because I love you, because I'm great in mercy, I'm great in love, I'm great in grace. And you now have accepted my son into your life, which means you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus takes away the sin. It was his blood, every ounce of that blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sins. And he washes us clean. There's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up. It's, it's kind of like this. If you go back to verse 6, if you go back to verse 6, let me go back to verse 6 here real quick. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Okay? So this is how this kind of works. This is how I image this. That when we were dead in our sins, that before we met Christ, we were down here. It was like being down here at the bottom of the stairs. 
God's up here and he's looking down at us and we're living a life according to like Paul said at the beginning of chapter one, to our own selfish desires, that we're living according to what the world is telling us and not to what the world or what not what God is telling us. And then all of a sudden, God uses the Holy Spirit to draw you to him. And you accept his son into, his, into, into your life. And then what God does is he reaches down to you. He meets you where you are. And he raises you up, makes you alive in Christ, and seats you next to him. You, we sung it in the song. Did you hear it in the song, that song, Champion? That song, Champion, screams Ephesians chapter 2. It talks about I was undeserving. I sinned. We were dead in our transgressions. But God, but God, who rich in mercy and rich in grace, comes down and meets us where we are and raises us up with him and seats us in the heavenly realms, which means he does not leave you where you are. It's a continual thing. He keeps with going with the grace after grace after grace. Now in verses 9 and 10, we see, and this is not by work so that no one can boast. Paul is finishing his thought from 7 and 8 here. Then he goes on to verse 10, which I think is one of the best verses about who we are supposed to be as Christians. Okay? Verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Remember last week we talked about that, predestination, foreordained, you were chosen, okay? Remember I explained to you that God doesn't look down the tunnel of time and picks and choose people he just already knows? You were created, you were made, but you were made for a purpose. Isaiah 43 says, you were made to glorify God, and you were made to do good works, because of the grace given to you by his son, Jesus Christ. That's what verse 10 is saying right here, that made new in Christ, created to do good works in him. And now listen, works can't save you. I'm gonna read you a list of a bunch of Christian things right here. None of this saves you. Baptism, church membership, attending church, communion, Trying to keep the Ten Commandments. I like how the author of this put trying. Living by the Sermon of the Mount. Whoa, let's raise the bar a little bit. Giving to charity. Being a good neighbor. Or better yet, this one I've heard used a lot. Just living a good, moral, and respectable life. None of that saves you. The only thing that saves you is when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and that grace changes your life and transforms your heart into doing good works. Listen, the Apostle Paul said it this way. He said it in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith with my deeds. Do you guys get that? One of the ways people know we're Christian is because we show our faith through our deeds, but our deeds do not save us. You cannot be good enough for God. You cannot be. Only Christ makes you alive again. Because before Jesus, if we're dead in our transgressions and sin, we're dead. And the only thing that can bring us back to life is Jesus. Watch this, Romans chapter 5, verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. There is that trespass word again, okay? For if many died by the trespass of the one man, he's talking about Adam here. Adam, remember Adam? It's the call, that's why they call it the fall of man, because that dummy sitting next to his wife, let his wife eat. It's his fault. Okay? If, if many died by the trespass of that one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? 
Then you tie that in with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old is gone, and the new is here. You have been made new and alive in Christ, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God has planned for you before the world was de- formed. This is what Paul is trying to tell us here. He's trying to tell us that we were created for a purpose. Being a Christian just doesn't mean you come to church and sit in a pew week after week. Jesus didn't. He walked and he talked with people. He called out sinners. He called out other people who thought they were believers in God too. Our job is, yes, our job is to come here and worship him. But in that worship, something should happen inside of us that when we walk out of this place, they see Jesus in us. They see our faith through our good works. And so God meets us where we are. He meets us where we are. Look at at verse 6 again. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. See, he reaches down for us and picks us up. And see, the great thing about grace is this. When we slip, because the Bible says we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God, which means we're all going to continue to kind of make mistakes and, and have these sins and do these things. God still reaches down to lift you up. It's something we don't deserve because, again, the Bible says according to it, the wages of sin are death. But the free gift of God is through Jesus Christ. It's eternal life. When you have a relationship with him, all of that is forgiven, and God grabs you and picks you up and seats you with him. You are now a believer in Jesus Christ. You are adopted. We talked about this last week. You are adopted into the family. You are his sons and daughters. You are kings and queens. And the world will know it if you show your faith through your deeds. But remember, your deeds don't save you. This next one is a little bit of a typo. It says Ephesians 2, 6. It's actually Isaiah 1, verse 18. Listen to what God says here. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they were red as crimson, they shall be like wool. He's not going to leave you where you are. He's going to come down, he's going to meet you where you are and raise you up where you need to be, seated with him in Christ Jesus. That's how this works. It works through a relationship with Jesus. And we, after that happens, are created to be his hands and feet. Okay? Now there's a verse in Romans, there's actually a section in Romans chapter 10 where a lot of people think, Paul's talking to pastors here, but he's not. He's actually talking to all of us. See, we're created to be his hands and feet. And in Romans chapter 10, he says this. It says, how can they, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Okay, how can somebody find Jesus if they don't believe in him? Because there's other verse in the Bible that says the cross is foolish to those who don't believe. But How can they call on the one that they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard of? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? Now, let's stop right there. Because this is where people think, oh, this is for a pastor, because we use that word preaching. The Greek word for this word preaching is caruso. It just means to proclaim. Everybody in this room who's a believer in Jesus Christ can proclaim the gospel in one of two ways, verbally like I'm doing now, or by action, by your deeds, showing your faith through your good works. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Okay, now wait a minute. 
So now you got to be sent. What's this sending? Well, now you have to stop right here and actually stick your finger in the book and flip over to Matthew 28, the Great Commission that we've all, a lot of us have heard this. And if you haven't, this is how it goes. Now, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I have commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. Now go back to Romans. How can anyone preach unless they are sent? We are all sent. We are all to live a life worthy of honoring and glorifying God. It's what he created you for. He said it in Isaiah. He said, I have called you by name and created you for my glory. The best way you can glorify God is by sharing the gospel with somebody. Because it's what he wants. He wants a relationship. The whole Old Testament is nothing but a story of God's relationship with his first chosen people, the Israelites. And he wants a relationship with them. But time and time again, they turn their back to other gods. Then they go back towards him. Then they turn their back and they go back towards them. Kind of sounds like me. By no means, me being up here means I'm perfect. There's times in my life where I turn my back on God because I don't run or trust him first. I forget the grace that he's given me. I forget about the, the richness of his mercy that he's giving me, that how he has shown me who I am in him, and I lose confidence in myself. That's what I struggle with. I mean, you saw at the beginning of this sermon when the tech failed. My confidence got broken. I'll, I'll call myself out on it. It's okay. My confidence got shaken. And in the middle of this sermon, I had to remember who I was and who I'm doing this for. Not for Tony, for him. Because he called me by name. He gave me this gift. And 1 Peter 4 says that we are to be good stewards of these gifts that God gives us. He's given each one of you a gift too. It also says in that verse that you have to use it. Use it. Be good stewards of God's grace, which he's given you, and use your gifts to win other people to him. It doesn't matter what your gift is. You don't, have to, you don't have to be able to stand up here in front of people. I know people who are scared to death to do this. And be perfectly honest with you, I am too. It is only by the grace of God that I can do this. But you have gifts that you can use. If your gift is smiling and greeting somebody and making somebody feel welcome, use it. If your gift is giving, give. If your gift is working with children, work with children. There's other ministries in this town besides, besides children's ministry here, which our children's ministry is great. If you want to volunteer, volunteer. But we also have other places like Alpha where you can volunteer and help mothers and babies. You know, there's a lot of political stuff going around in this world and sometimes we get so angered by it, we sit in front of the TV, in front of Fox News or CNN, and we're like so outraged because of what's going on, but all we're doing is we're just sitting there, screaming at a TV. If abortion upsets you, Go volunteer at Alpha. They're on the front lines of abortion. If politics is your thing, then be a Christian in politics. The whole thing is based on what God's grace has given you, your gifts. We figure that out because we have a relationship with him. We pray. We read his word. We worship him. All of these things... We read his word. All of this communicates with God. He even tells us in his word, if you want to hear him, be still. He'll tell you which way to go. He'll show you how to do it. He will open doors that he wants to open and close doors that need to be shut because he's sovereign. He's in control. And we need to preach the gospel to everyone. 
everyone. Very last sentence of that verse, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know, if you ask the world what beauty means, they'll probably show you pictures of supermodels or, or whatever. But beauty, according to God, is those who bring the good news. Those who bring the news that God loves you so much that he sent his only son in the form of a baby to die on a cross so that you can have the forgiveness of sins, so that you can become a child of God, and that you can experience this, this abundance of good grace daily in your life. This is what God wants for you. And some of you here today, he's calling you. You feel it. It's what led you here. Something this morning said you needed to be in church. And if that's you today, this is your moment. If you want to answer that gospel call, in a few seconds, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to pray. And you can just repeat the words that I repeat. If you want to experience good grace, day after day. And I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to blow smoke. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be perfect. I'm not going to tell you that all your problems are going to disappear. But I will tell you that it's a blessed life and it's a grace given life and that God loves you so much that he will give you that grace. I love the verse in Lamentations where it says, every morning it's made new. Every morning. You get to wake up, clean slate and you start all over again. You pick yourself up. Remember, God picks you up, brings you where he is, and dusts you off and said, it's okay, my child. Go for it. If that's you here today and you want to know more about Jesus, we have these two places back here called Following Jesus. Grab the little black book called Following Jesus. If you want to talk to somebody, I'd be more than happy to talk to you after service and explain this stuff to you more. But if you all right now, please just bow your heads and we're going to pray. So those of you who want to accept Jesus today, just repeat after me. Father, I love you. You sent your son to die on a cross for me. And so today, God, I commit my life to you. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so, Father, I thank you that you have given me grace, that you have shown me mercy, that you've, that you've spared me from my punishment. But now, accepting your Son as my Lord and Savior, you have now given me eternal life and shown me grace. And so, Father, I thank you Jesus, I love you. And so today, Lord, I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Again, if that's you, take a moment in your bulletin. You got that connection card. Rip, give that thing a good rip and mark on the back of it, I've committed my life to Jesus. We would love to walk this walk with you. We have staff members who would just love to talk to you. And so... Take a minute, fill out your connection cards, and we'll be right back.